All right, welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. This is going to be a quicker video, and it's going to be intended to be a direct comparison of beta blocker versus calcium channel blocker toxicity, okay? If I could just take a quick 60 seconds of your time, I wanted to introduce our newest Whiteboard Medicine emergency and critical care community, and that is our Patreon community. Here we post emergency and critical care medicine medical education topics every other day. We focus on landmark trials, new trials, clinical pearls, bedside tips and tricks, and much more. Everything emergency and critical care. We also upload study guides for each video. We have practice tests. And our newest addition is going to be mini courses that kind of lay out video study guides, practice questions um, into an easily digestible form that we hope is very applicable and helpful to the bedside. Our goal is to try to get even 1% of our YouTube community to join our Patreon community. It would be incredibly helpful in allowing us to spend more time creating content and elevating our current content. We appreciate you all and we hope to see many of you there. Uh, we actually came out with two episodes dedicated, one to beta blocker toxicity and two to calcium channel blocker toxicity, um, but there's going to be a comparison. So if you want more detailed explanation, definitely dive into those other episodes. They're linked in the toxicology playlist, um, but there's going to be a direct comparison as these two have a lot of overlap and both for taking care of patients in the clinical arena as well as tests. Um, often these two are um, kind of compared to each other and there's test questions on how to differentiate them. So that's what I wanted to dive into today. As always, the study guide will be on our Patreon page linked in the episode description. Uh, all of our study guides and practice questions and ad-free videos and all that good stuff are all on there if you want to check it out. No further ado, beta blocker versus calcium channel blocker, quick comparison. So obviously we have beta blocker toxicity on the left side, calcium channel blocker toxicity on the right side. And we're going to go through the differences, starting with mechanism. And this is not going to be as much detail, but it's nice as a quick comparison. So beta blockers obviously are going to block the beta receptor. As we've talked about, there's some sodium channel receptor blocking in certain beta blockers like propranolol. And there's even at times um, some of them that can cross the blood brain barrier and cause CNS effect if they're lipophilic. But the primary mechanism is beta blocker receptor activity decrease. And that typically decreases chronotropy, so decreases heart rate. It decreases inotropy or the squeeze of the heart. It can cause conduction problems um, and it can decrease blood pressure too. Okay. Calcium channel blocker toxicity, on the other hand, focuses on these L-type calcium channels. And blocking those are going to decrease the amount of calcium that influxes into your muscles, the myocardium being the heart muscle uh, as a primary um, muscle affected here. And that's also going to impair cardiac contractility, conduction, and vascular tone. So as you can see, there's a good amount of overlap between the results of beta blocker and calcium channel blocker toxicity, um, although how they achieve those results are uh, obviously different mechanisms. So the onset of action here for beta blockers is typically rapid. Now there are extended release versions of beta blockers, right? Brand name Toprolol would be one of those. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but many beta blockers have a rapid onset of action. Calcium channel blockers many are a little bit more delayed um, and many people take extended release formulations of calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blocker toxicity comes on a little bit later in general than beta blocker toxicity, although that's obviously very dependent on the beta blocker calcium channel blocker, right? So that we can talk about generalities, but it really depends on which medication it is. Symptoms here, as you're going to see, have a ton of overlap. So beta blockers, bradycardia, calcium channel blockers, bradycardia, beta blockers, hypotension, calcium channel blockers, hypotension, beta blockers, fatigue and dizziness, calcium channel blockers, fatigue and dizziness. Now we get into a couple differences. One of the big ones to note is that calcium channel blockers tend to cause hyperglycemia because they inhibit insulin release, whereas beta blockers tend to cause hypoglycemia. So that's one of the big differences, and tests love to test this little factoid. So calcium channel blockers, hyperglycemia, beta blockers, hypoglycemia. Beta blockers also can cause bronchospasm through the beta 2 receptor that you don't often see with calcium channel blockers. Anecdotally, I don't feel like I see a ton of bronchospasm from beta blocker toxicity, but it can happen, certainly. All right, so that's another difference. So beta blockers, hypoglycemia, and bronchospasm. Calcium channel blockers, hyperglycemia, no bronchospasm. And then in both of these, you can get neuro effects, but it depends. So in beta blockers, you can get seizures, coma, mental status, depression, but only with lipophilic or fat-loving beta blockers. Again, things like propranolol. Whereas calcium channel blockers, 
seizures, you can get altered mental status and confusion, but there's not as much, you know, seizures per se in calcium channel blocker overdose um, as you can get with lipophilic beta blockers like propranolol. All right. If you do have a calcium a beta blocker that has sodium channel blocking properties, you can get QRS prolongation that increases your risk for arrhythmias. Um, and again, propranolol is one of those that can do that. And sodalol, being a beta blocker, kind of has its own little pathodrome um, within the beta blocker context because it has more QT prolonging and risk for something like torsades. But the big differences here would be that um, the glucose is going to be high hyperglycemia in calcium channel blockers, and the glucose is going to be low or hypoglycemia in beta blockers. Beta blockers have bronchospasm, calcium channel blockers do not. And beta blockers, if it's a lipophilic beta blocker like propranolol, have more incidence of seizures, whereas calcium channel blockers do not. So, what about the clinical symptom uh, or clinical signs that you'll see? Well, these are related, obviously, to some of those symptoms and the mechanism, right? You'll get bradycardia with each of them. You can get AV blocks with each of them. You get hypotension and cardiogenic shock with each of them. And then we talked about hypoglycemia and beta blockers, hyperglycemia and calcium channel blockers. We talked about bronchospasm and beta blockers, no bronchospasm and calcium channel blockers. And then if you're on something like sodalol, you can get wide QRS. Or sorry, um, um, if you're on something like propranolol that has sodium channel blocking, you can get wide QRS. If you're on something like sodalol, you can get prolonged QTC. Um, and you can get metabolic acidosis and severe shock with each of these. Um, all the calcium channel blockers maybe have a little more predilection. Um, pulmonary edema is possible in both of these as well, especially if you're in cardiogenic shock. So when it comes to kind of signs, some of the main ones that can differentiate these are really the glucose and then bronchospasm um, because there's a lot of overlap between them otherwise. All right, what about key labs and bedside things? This all comes back to the primary mechanisms. Um, some of the only key lab differences, like we talked about, hypoglycemia with beta blockers, hyperglycemia with calcium channel blockers. Hopefully, that is ingrained in your brain now. And then seizures, if it's a lipophilic beta blocker like propranolol, are more common. Uh, and metabolic acidosis is more common in calcium channel blockers. But at the end of the day, that's you know not even perfectly applicable because if someone's in shock, um, which you can go into cardiogenic shock from beta blocker overdose, you certainly can get a metabolic acidosis there too. So how do we treat these two things? What are the differences in treatment? Well, the main differences here are going to um, be a couple different medications you could consider. So for both of them, you're going to start by treating with, you know, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, get peripheral IVs, fluids if they need it, although if they're in cardiogenic shock, you're not going to be wanting to give them fluids. You can certainly try giving atropine in both of these, but if it does work, which it might not, if it does work, it's going to be transient, so that's certainly not a solution to this. Next, though, in beta blockers, you often start with something like glucagon, um, which can increase your amount of cyclic AMP uh, that can help, whereas in calcium channel blockers, you do not. In calcium channel blockers, you tend to give calcium to overcome the calcium channel blockade. All right, so that's one of the big differences. In beta blocker toxicity, you're going to trial glucagon. In calcium channel blocker toxicity, you're going to trial calcium. Both of these can benefit from high dose insulin euglycemic therapy, which we talked a lot about in those original episodes. Both of these can benefit from vasopressors with a particular focus on epinephrine because epinephrine has both beta and alpha effects, whereas norepinephrine is primarily alpha effects. Both of these can essentially benefit from IV lipid emulsion, um, but it has to be for lipophilic or fat-loving beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. If someone's sick enough, though, you might just try that in general for all of them. And then all of them, if patients have refractory shock and they're not getting better with your other interventions, um, might need ECMO. So you can see here, management, which is nice because it's sometimes hard to differentiate between these two uh, toxicities, and management is very similar or lots of overlap with one of the key kind of differences is glucagon and beta blockers, calcium and calcium channel blockers. And then again, for treatment and beta blockers, if you do have um, QRS widening from sodium channel blockade, you're going to be giving something like bicarbonate therapy. All right. And then unique pearls. This is the end. Again, this is just a quick kind of cheat sheet to compare these two unique pearls here. Um, again, Beta blockers think hypoglycemia, think seizures, that can point more towards beta blockers, whereas calcium channel blockers think more hyperglycemia um, in calcium channel blockers. In lipophilic beta blockers like propranolol and carvedilol think CNS depression, and that's where you get some of those seizures. Um, verapamil uh, tends to cause worse cardiogenic shock than dihydropyridines in the calcium channel blocker varietal because verapamil and diltiazem are non 
dihydropyridines, which mean they have more cardiac effect um, as just kind of little pearls here. So when comparing the two, either in the real world or in the test setting, nicely in the real world, uh, therapies overlap significantly. And we talked about a lot early aggressive interventions for these patients, but beta blocker toxicity, you're going to be trying glucagon calcium channel blocker toxicity, you're going to be trialing calcium. Um, clinical things that can differentiate them, especially on the test, would be hyperglycemia for calcium channel blockers, hypoglycemia for beta blockers. Also, calcium channel blockers do not have bronchospasm, if that's included in kind of the test vignette as well. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, if it's a lipophilic or a fat-loving beta blocker, sometimes you see a little more seizure in the beta blocker toxidrome. All right, hopefully that was helpful. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have. Uh, we'd love for you to check out our Patreon page, YouTube platform, podcast platform. Uh, we would love to buff those up and interact with y'all um, kind of across multiple different uh, varietals there. So definitely check those out if you have an interest. Either way, nonetheless, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.